thanks for the, uh, the questions. The scroll is lot, much longer than the Treaty of Waitangi, <laughs> which really says the Treaty of Waitangi was not specific on a lot of points. <laughs> And uh, some of these are very specific points which we'll try and look at. But I thought it might be useful. I'll, I'll just read out the question. And then if the person who uh, suggested it wants to add anything to it to help us understand the question a bit more, that, would, that could be quite useful. If you don't want to do that, that's fine as well. And some of the writing isn't as easy uh, as... Uh, and my eyes are not as good as they used to be, put it that way. Uh, this is the, uh, I'll just take them as they come, and this says, given the uh, interpretational, I think is the word, given the interpretational nature of the treaty, how authoritative does it remain <coughs> as a foundation document for this nation? Would, uh, does anyone want to comment on that question a bit, to explain a bit more behind what's behind the question? And That's what you meant. <laughs> um, because it's, it's, a, uh, it's a question that many New Zealanders are asking. Here we have a document uh, that goes back to 1840, and uh, one, one view is that its, it's relevance in 1840 was, was perhaps uh, obvious. What, of, what, of, what is its relevance, and what place does it have in New Zealand, in modern New Zealand? More importantly, beyond today, because it's uh, not so much today we think about, but tomorrow. And there are a number of views on it. Uh, one not uncommon view, and in fact, I think that if you uh, went and asked this question in the streets of Hamilton, something like 80% of the people that you approached, if you approached them randomly and didn't approach your friends, but 80% of the people you approach would probably say that the treaty has no place in modern New Zealand. I think that's a common a commonly held view in New Zealand. And of the remainder, probably 10, 15% would say it should be the only document upon which we build New Zealand's future. And the others would agree, but not perhaps to that extent. So there's quite a range of views on that in New Zealand. The majority view probably is that it's not, the, it's not a hugely significant document for the future of the country. I think, I think that'd be the common viewpoint. Now, uh, here you find that, in fact, the view of the Crown, if I'm, I'm talking about the Crown now, not, not as Parliament, but as the, uh, as the executive of the government, the view of the Crown is probably quite different from the view of the majority of New Zealanders, because the Crown is in a position where it has accepted the obligations of the treaty handed down year after year as quite a binding and significant document. So I think if you, if you lined all the cabinet ministers in the country up, and instead of shooting them, you asked them this question, <laughs> my, my guess is that they would say that we uh, believe the treaty is a hugely important document upon which New Zealand's future should be built. I think that's probably the crown view. 
if you ask the crown, when, if you ask the same people when they're in opposition about that, they might have different views. But there seems to be, uh, within New Zealand, a sense that the crown has some continuing, ongoing obligation for a deal that was made by the predecessors, albeit it was a British government, that many years ago. The, the other, uh, so that there's this distinction then, I think, between the view of the crown, I think that's the view of the crown now, uh, it wasn't always. I mean, for the most part, the New Zealand government, having signed the treaty, put it to one side. Uh, it, was, it was simply a vehicle to obtain sovereignty over New Zealand. And that's why we've got so many claims to the Waitangi Tribunal, because the, the Crown put it to one side. Now, uh, I think if you ask the same question of, of uh, 100 Māori people you meet in Hamilton, 85% of them would take the other view, that the treaty is very important to the future of New Zealand. Why the difference? And the difference has to do, I think, with, with two traditions that have developed in New Zealand. And we've got a good record in both of these things, uh, but they tend to be clashing. Or there's the potential for them to clash if we don't manage it well. One tradition that we have in New Zealand, that every uh, person is as good as the neighbour. We, we, uh, we all experience, we're all, uh, all products of the 1935 welfare state and one of the huge uh, contributions that New Zealand made to the world in 1935 was this idea that everyone is equal in this country, we all have the same rights and that we all deserve the same go, a, a, good, a fair go. And that was basically that the, uh, the welfare state introduced this notion in quite a strong way and we were a classless, as much a classless society then as any other country in the world. So we hold pretty dear, I think, most New Zealanders hold pretty dear the idea that as citizens, we all have a right to the same opportunities, we all deserve a fair go, we're all uh, equally important. And that's, that's a strong New Zealand tradition. We were the first country that women gave women the full vote, for example. So we've got a strong tradition in individual rights. We also have a strong tradition in indigenous rights, which is what the Treaty of Waitangi is about. Uh, the Treaty of Waitangi was, of course, to be the model document which, which talked about how a colonising power, Great Britain, would interact with an indigenous group. And uh, although there have been huge, a number of breaches of the treaty, since 1975 at least, you can find that New Zealand's record in indigenous rights is as good as anyone in the world. That's not actually saying a huge amount because they're pretty bad in most places in the world. But we've been leaders in many fields. I mean, we've, uh, since say, 1867, there have been four Māori seats in Parliament. Many indigenous people around the world are now trying to get that. So that we've been a bit ahead of the play in some ways. I'm not saying it's been perfect. But we've got a pretty good tradition in indigenous rights. We've got a very good tradition in equality as between individuals. Now, the question then comes up, if we say that everyone's equal and everyone has the same chances and we, we recognise the worth of every individual, how do we reconcile that with a particular group of rights that we acknowledge, we recognise for indigenous people? Therein, I think, lies the challenge. Now, the Treaty of Waitangi is one way of negotiating that. If you compare the New Zealand situation, say, with Aborigines in Australia or the First Nations of Canada, or the uh, American Indians in uh, USA, there are similar issues, but they're handled quite differently. And the thing that seems to make the difference is this notion that between the Crown on the one hand and Māori people on the other, there is a relationship of some priority. Now, uh, people argue, of course, that that clashes with this notion of individual equality. We need to, I think we've got a tradition in both, how can we reconcile the two so that we can continue to have a tradition in indigenous rights and respect that without compromising the rights that all New Zealanders have as individuals. And that's the challenge. I think uh, that's the essential nature of the treaty. Sometimes the treaty has been uh, has been, I think, uh, misinterpreted in recent times as being about Māori disadvantage. 
so that closing the gaps, for example, the, the ill-fated policy that never actually got off the ground, closing the gaps, uh, tended to give the impression that really that you can justify the Treaty of Waitangi because Māori have socio-economic disadvantage. Well, you don't need a Treaty of Waitangi to say that we shouldn't, should not tolerate socio-economic disadvantage. If Pacific Island people or disabled people or people have had a mental breakdown, if any group of people in our society are disadvantaged, we should not tolerate that. You don't need the treaty to argue that. So closing the gaps is not really a treaty argument, it's an a, uh, equity argument. Then some people say, well, the Treaty of Waitangi is all about settling claims. In fact, uh, the government before this one, one of the prime ministers of the government before this one, when asked, and there's a choice there, when asked, about <laughs> when asked about the meaning of the Treaty of Waitangi, said, oh, what is your, when we asked what is your treaty policy, said we're settling the claims as quickly as we can. Confused a treaty policy with a claims policy. Settling claims is about correcting the injustices of the past. It's not about the Treaty of Waitangi per se. It's about injustice. And you don't really need a treaty to argue for justice. That's what that's the, the society we have argues for justice. So that really the treaty is not so much about uh, disadvantage or about the injustices of the past. It's about reconciling citizenship that we all enjoy with the particular position of indigenous people. And the treaty is somewhere in the middle of those two things. How it, how it can mediate those two important aspects of our New Zealand life, I think we're, we're discovering. Now that's not to say, therefore, that the treaty is the one important thing in our future, because we do, we, we've got a proud record in the rights of individuals. We have a hugely uh, proud record of that in New Zealand and make good progress with it. We have a, uh, a number of uh, ethnic groups in New Zealand, starting with the Scots and the Welsh and the Irish, and more recently, uh, Korean and Thai migrants, and, and uh, we, we recognise them, we recognise their culture, we celebrate their culture. Uh, so we've got that tradition. We also have the tradition of indigenous rights. Now, in countries that don't have that tradition, who, who don't have the, the mediating influence of the treaty, they struggle to reconcile these two things. Indigenous rights on the one hand, citizenship rights on the other. I don't think that answers your question. It raises some of the issues behind your question. I think that's a good, uh, I'll leave it at that and there's lots of other questions I'm sure that, that you have to answer so I'll answer. Great opening, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> With a little bit of relief, I'll move on to the next question. <laughs> <laughs> which is <laughs> that uh, many, many Pākehā of older generations have become alienated through what they perceive as a fast-track integration of the treaty back into the fabric of our nation. How are we, Tato, going to build an acute awareness of the treaty matters back into our multicultural society, a society which is becoming increasingly multiracial? And how are we going to do that for our Tamariki's generation, as it isn't a key point of curriculum. I, th I think the key issue there, well, would, would someone, did anyone remember who wrote that? Oh, yeah. Yeah, well, I, I guess I'd like to go back to your straw, your straw poll, or talking about the United States percent. They kind of would say it was important, and yet it's kind of a founding document, and, and it's becoming more of a fabric of our society. So if in our education system, we're not dealing with these issues even now. How are we going to build an awareness that means we can knit our society together you know, in, in harmony, which I guess is the guiding principle behind the treaty? Yeah. The, uh, I had the great uh, uh, fortune this year on the 6th of uh, February, when the treaty was being celebrated all around the country, <laughs> except at Waitangi. I oh, know it wasn't, <laughs> including at Waitangi. <laughs> <laughs> not being celebrated. I went to a function at the gov at government house, and the governor general made a speech. And in her speech, she said exactly the question you've raised. 
that uh, here we are celebrating an event that happened uh, in 1840, and yet to many New Zealanders who have lived here all their life, they're a little bit hazy about what is the significance of the event and what actually was the event. And she said that, the, that uh, the, she suspects, and I think she suspects with good authority, that the government is going to do something about that. And I've heard that what the government is planning to do is to establish a commission that will have exactly this purpose to provide an educational framework. Now, uh, this has been done before. There was a, a very important group in New Zealand called Project Waitangi in the 1980s, and that's exactly what they did. Uh, I, I think if we're going to do this, it, it needs to be done, though, in a, uh, in a way which the long-term aim is to build a stronger nation, not to create a fragmented nation. And, I mean, that, that's, uh, that, that's my view about how the process should go. And one of, the, uh, one of the important things, therefore, is to be able to be real about what New Zealand society is currently like, and then to see how the treaty can enrich that. So the treaty isn't presented as something which you hang over people's heads in the same way that I remember the Ten Commandments being held over my head, <laughs> daring me not to break them. The treaty is held, over, uh, is held up as something which can enrich the life of the nation without diminishing other aspects of our nationhood. And if the educational process that's being, going to be embarked on this year, I understand, perhaps after the election, <laughs> <laughs> if, uh, if, if that's the process we're going to do, the, the uh, concern I would have is that it's presented in a way that leads ultimately to a stronger nation and which is premised largely on the future and not the problems of the past. One of the difficulties with the Project Waitangi, although maybe it was symbolic of its time, the, the Project Waitangi educational process tended to present the treaty debate as a debate about grievance. It is really a, a, a debate about development. So in, in 1840, people weren't really worrying, wanting to look backwards. They wanted to emphasise the forward development of New Zealand so that New Zealand stood pretty well in the wider national affairs. And I think that if we're going to have a debate about the treaty and its place and its education uh, about it, the useful thing is to be looking at this as not about grievance and not about injustice, even though they, I'm not minimising the importance of those things, but about the development of the country so that there are winners all round. You'll notice I'm not actually answering any of the questions, <laughs> but I'm using the questions to talk about the issues. Oh, well, academics are very good at, uh, at setting questions but not necessarily answering them. They expect the students to answer them. That's a politician. <laughs> yeah. Well, politicians change the subject altogether. <laughs> I'm, not doing, I'm not being quite as bad as that, I hope. <laughs> you spoke as if tinoranga tiratanga means sovereignty, control of all matters, all matters and affairs. Doesn't the second article, even in the Māori version, limit tinoranga tiratanga to the possessions specified? Does anyone remember? Oh, yeah, do you want just to round that a bit? And it's pretty clear as it is, but... You know. I, I would second wholeheartedly what you said about the treaty and its development and, and the direction in which it's going. It is forward-looking, but there is a tendency treating treating matters, among some people anyway, to work towards separation. And I just thought that um, my training as a lawyer, that I've long since gone from law to grace, um, <laughs> that, uh, you yeah, know, the treaty is a very, in some ways, quite a specific document that outlines certain things. And one of the things there is re re relates to Tino and uh, Tino and uh, Tino Tango as related to those very specific things. Well, the palm is not very easy to find, but that's not a question. Um, isn't that true, though? I mean, there are a lot of things like health, there are a lot of things like international travel, a lot of things like uh, the nature of government, which the treaty simply could not have anticipated. And uh, 
it really does talk about you know where it kind of did at home, it's talking about personal positions, which I hope would be given to every citizen in New Zealand, Maori, Chinese or other. Yes, the, the um, uh, there is a difference between the two, the flavour of English and Māori in Article 2. Article 2 in English, the flavour of it is very much property rights. And that doesn't say anything new, really. I mean, what, what it says in, uh, in uh, English is that if you own any property, you can keep it. Well, that's true for all of us, isn't it? That, um, that's common law, that if you own something, it's yours, and no one can take it from you unless they pass an act of parliament, which takes it away from you. So there's, that is actually nothing new. That's a common law right that everyone possesses, and that's the spirit of the English article, the English version of Article 2, that if you own property, and what it says is we guarantee you the, the full, exclusive, and undisturbed possession of your lands, forests, fisheries, estates, and other properties. Uh, we could equally say to, you, to all of us here that we guarantee that if you own your car, provided you keep up the payments, it's yours. <laughs> and your house is yours and we won't take it away from you. The Maori version of Article 2 moves into a different plane in that it is much less specific about property ownership and the notion of tēnō ranga tēnātanga moves into the, into the area of the decision-making about those. And so that it's less focused on property rights and more focused on the ability to control those rights. So there is a variation between the two. Uh, at the same time, it's one article in a total treaty. And the important part of the treaty, if you go and look at article by article, is that all three articles are important. So the question that would come up if uh, people are interpreting tino ranga tiratanga to mean absolute Māori control, somehow that's got to reconcile with Article 1 of the treaty, which is about the right of the government to govern. At the very least, if, even if we leave the sovereignty thing aside, Article 1 says the government has the right to govern. Somehow those two things have got to reconcile. And so the, the notion that, uh, that New Zealand's future might be as a Māori state and a New Zealand state doesn't hang well with the treaty which wasn't about that. It hangs quite well with the Declaration of Independence, which was about a Maori nation, a Maori nation state. But the treaty was about a, a single nation state within which certain guarantees and certain rights would be protected and respected. So I think the, the, the focus just on that article in isolation of the others um, and some people have used that as an argument for total Māori independence, where Māori might pull away from the nation of New Zealand and form the Māori nation, Māori nation state. Now, I think if you, if you went and surveyed 100 Māori people out in the street, of Hamilton, probably, uh, a bit hard to judge Hamilton, but uh, if you surveyed 100 Māori people, most would say we're not talking about a separate Māori nation state where you need a passport to go from one part of New Zealand to the other. We're not talking about that. We're talking about being able to retain an element of autonomy, at least in respect of our own affairs, so that it's not lost entirely as a, uh, not subjected entirely to bureaucratic interference. Now, I think that's, for most people, that's what tino ranga tiratanga would mean. Whether it's delivering a health service, Want, if we deliver our own health services, much more chance they'll be used, get to the people who need it. It, it might be in respect of management of your own land. So that I think it's, in, in some ways, you see, that message that uh, autonomy and that communities should have their own autonomy, well, I mean, Roger Douglas was right at home with that conversation. The, 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 uh, the, the, the far right, which we sometimes used to call the loony right, was actually uh, quite supportive of that notion that minimal interference from the government. <laughs> so I think the, uh, but I, the point is that, that I, I, th I think the idea of a separate, a separatist Maori state is not a mainstream Maori view, although it is a Maori view. There are some people who espouse it. Uh, 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 in the, in the Wanganui, when the gardens were occupied, 
that shaped up to be a talk in the end, and largely from uh, one or two protagonists, uh, Ken Mayer, for example, was one. He was arguing in that line, in that direction, I think. It's a bit hard to tell, he changed his argument from time to time. But I think the argument was of a separate Maori state. Um, it would be very difficult to have a separate Maori state, uh, particularly in the, uh, unless you <laughs> have it without having a geographical state, you know, so that, uh, I mean, you sort of split, you take the North Island, we'll take the South, or the other way around. Uh, it'd, be, uh, it'd be fairly difficult, I think, to do. On the other hand, the question of autonomy is quite consistent with the movement in many countries about where, that indigenous people want to have more say in managing their own affairs. So there's a difference, I think, between autonomy and a separate Maori state. I think it would be pretty hard for a separate Maori state to work. I also think the Crown would not allow it. I, I, I think that, see, there's this draft declaration of the rights of indigenous people, which will be, uh, um, will be presented to you, the United Nations within the next year or two for ratification. And in it, it says at present that indigenous people have the right to self-determination. Now, the New Zealand government is just a little unhappy about that because they think self-determination might be interpreted as pulling away from the, national, from the nation state and establishing your own nation state. Uh, other countries are taking a much stronger view on it. They say we would never allow self-determination if it means pulling out of the, of the state and establishing your own country, your own nation. So New Zealand's introduced that idea, but I, I think that... Um, if they define self-determination as something short of cession from your own country, then I think the declaration might, would be supported by New Zealand. So in, in summary then, I, I think the, uh, the Tenoranga Tiratanga in Article 2 has got to be seen in the context of a whole treaty, which is about the right of the government to govern, the guarantee that Māori can exercise authority over their own affairs, in so, as long as that's compatible with the right of the government to govern. That's a question, of course, how do, you, how do you work that out? And the good thing is that people are talking about it and negotiating it to reach a position on it. Uh, and then the other part of your question was, is this likely to lead on to some national Maori movement? Certainly people are talking about it. The, the papers love people who talk about that, so that if you, if you only rely on the Auckland Herald and the Dominion, <laughs> you would get the impression that all Māori people are wanting to pull out of New Zealand, send all Pākehā people out of the country and establish the Māori uh, nation state. Uh, because they give so much publicity to that when I don't think it's a, it's a, it's a widely held Māori view, although a widely held Māori view is that you should be able to have an ex exercise a degree of autonomy. Did you, did you want to say anything to that? Yeah. yeah. Would you give that same autonomy to other racial groups in New Zealand? If I was a member of the ACT Party, I'd be advocating it. Because, <laughs> well, I mean, that's the ACT position, isn't it? That there should be minimal interference from the government and that people should have maximum autonomy over their own affairs. What is it? Your oh, my position is that uh, we probably need a government. <laughs> and that autonomy, no one has autonomy. None of us will ever be autonomous. We're, New Zealand is so small, we're all intermarried and linked up one way or another. You know someone's cousin who's married to you or someone else's uh, auntie. We're, we're all so closely linked that I think autonomy is always relative. And that we might aspire for autonomy, whether, whether we be a church group or an iwi, or a hapu, or a marae, we always aspire towards autonomy, but autonomy is always, always limited in New Zealand because we have our neighbours, and we can never be autonomous in that sense. And so that I, I really think that... Um, no, not on, not on the, this year, I don't think. <laughs> No, ACT C says uh, individual liberty is the, is the guiding point, and they tend to underplay the collective responsibility, and, and, and I think that there is a need for collective responsibility. Uh, 
But autonomy, I think, is something that all groups aspire to. I, I, I mean, uh, I belong to half a dozen groups. Messi wants to be absolutely autonomous. Um, uh, Fielding is always trying to maintain its autonomy from Palmerston North <laughs> and is partially successful. And it's a fact of New Zealand life. Whenever you get 10 people together, they want to form a committee and be an autonomous committee <laughs> with their own constitution. <laughs> So I think we do aspire as a nation towards having autonomy and not, not being uh, bullied by other people. At the same time, uh, we are so small that absolute autonomy is, uh, is undesirable and I think unlikely to work. You spoke of uh, tino ranga tiratanga. You spoke uh, Sorry, I've, I've read that one, haven't I? This one's in pencil. I was interested in Hobson, in Hobson handing the responsibility of explaining the treaty to Colenso, that is the church. We haven't done a very good job of this over the years. I wonder how you see the church in this role of explaining the treaty or ministry in the spirit of the treaty. How do we do this? Um... Well, uh, yes and no. <laughs> well, who, who was it that, uh, that uh, wrote the question? Do you want to explain it a bit more? Just that the treaty is not about social disadvantage or injustices of the past. And, and if the church is meant to be, I guess, agents of positive change and, and bringing a message of hope and reconciliation, then um, I guess we have that responsibility to to speak into and to act in a Christ-like way into these issues. So I'm just um, wondering from your view what, how, what kind of paint a picture of what that might look like. But I think first of all that the church uh, in New Zealand has been really reasonably successful in maintaining a level of awareness about the treaty over the years. So although, uh, although you, you, you've felt perhaps it hasn't nearly been nearly good enough, I suspect that without the influence of the church, and I'm using that in the very broad sense, that the level of awareness would actually have been much less than it actually is. And in the years when uh, the Crown did not want to know about the treaty, the church sort of kept it going, if only in pockets within the church. But the, uh, in more recent times, I think you can find examples where the church has taken the lead in promoting debate about the treaty. Now, how can the church best do that? On the one hand, uh, seminars like this, I think, are quite useful. And um, the, the fact that people want to come give up a beautiful Saturday to come and talk about the Treaty of Waitangi, I think, says something, uh, that the church is wanting to understand it. Uh, so that they can take a, if not take a position on it, then at least be in, a, in an informed position when debate does come up. Some churches, of course, have taken a strong position on it. The, the Anglican Church redesigned its whole synod to fit in with the treaty. Now, if you can change the constitution of the Anglican Church, you can do anything. But, <laughs> but that, that, uh, that was changed largely to fit around a treaty framework of people's rather than individual people. Um, the, the critical issue for the, for the church, I think, is not necessarily a promotion of the treaty as a promotion of the values upon which the treaty is based. And those values are fairly fundamental Christian values, which have to do with fairness and honesty and ensuring that people have the right to develop to their full and have the right to be themselves. And that right to be themselves includes the right to be Māori, for example. And in the, uh, that hasn't always been the case in New Zealand. So that I think it's not so much the direct advo advocacy for the treaty that the church will contribute to as the promotion of the values upon which the treaty rests. You, oh, that was a long one. 
You spoke of New Zealand's way of approaching the dilemma of the two versions of the treaty. Is not the 1975 Act and Tribunal a Pākehā way of staying in control? Why have you not argued for support of the contra pro forentum approach that has emerged in the international community? Are we outside exempt from this? My church, Catholic, speaks of an option for the poor, least as a fundamental biblical principle. Is this not what Lord McNair's formulation way proposed? So the, the, the question here is, um, the, uh, remember I presented three options for handling the treaty uh, principles. For handling the treaty, one is ignore one version, then the contra preferentum rule, and then I talked about the way we do it in New Zealand, which is through the, uh, uh, going back to the principles of the treaty. But did anyone want to expand on that question? Patty from the Auckland Catholic Diocese. Um, I suppose one of the things that we do when we talk about the treaty is we begin with the Maori text. That, and, and for most of us who, who can't speak Maori, it's the English translate, direct literal translation, but not the English text that you began with. Um, and the whole thing about the, um, how do you relate the two together? And, and do you give one priority or do you try and blend them? Um, I think has been a major struggle for many church people. Um, and seeing our church, at least in intentional language, talks about an option for the poor. I see very much the um, international community sort of developing guidelines around giving preference to the one that's in the indigenous language that hasn't been formulated by the, in by the indigenous people. Would you like to comment? No, you're, you're quite right insofar as that's the intention of the contra preferentum, and you're also quite right that uh, that. Um, there is a disadvantage to the indigenous group because they were not actively involved in drawing up the treaty. The question of uh, the New Zealand approach, should we, uh, why, we've, why we've adopted the approach we have and have tended to not follow the path of the contra pro forentum rule, uh, had to do, I think, with the, the position New Zealand was in in 1975, which was being able to uh, make progress in a way that allowed the treaty to be brought into, the leg into a legislative framework. And uh, you see, unless the treaty is in the law, it cannot be enforced. Now, the, the Treaty of Waiting Act was one of the very early acts that brought the treaty into a legislative framework and was couched in terms that were essentially designed to get it through the legislative process. And one of the compromises on that was giving way on the contra pro forentum rule. The suspicion is, and I think a fairly accurate one, that if Norman Kirk's government had put up in 1975, the interpretation of the treaty should be based first on the Maori version and second on the English version, that it's unlikely to have been passed. So you see here a political compromise to ensure the passage of the Act so that the tribunal can be established. And I think that's what it was that it was a political compromise. Was it fair or wasn't it fair, which is, I guess, the question that you're raising. International experts say it's not fair, but the same international experts come over and have a look to see how we're doing, because they see here as a way forward, when many other countries have run into an obstacle that they haven't been able to progress. So it's, it's what I refer to as the number eight wire approach. We've sort of said, well, pragmatically, let's have a go. If we can make progress down this track, if we compromise that, then, then it can be done. And that was the birth of the 1975 Act. It did, it did compromise that particular issue and put that principle aside in favor of an examination of the treaty's principles rather than the text of the treaty. If at the heart of that compromise is the um, denial 
of what I believe may be the majority of chiefs in signing the um, Maori text, what they felt was happening for them and what they were willing to let go of. How do you feel about that? Say that, say that again. My understanding is probably the majority of chiefs that signed it didn't feel that their authority or their mana was going to be diminished in the signing. Right. In fact, it was, would be enhanced. I suspect, right. So, if they didn't feel that they were giving away any of what they understood to be um, authority or sovereignty, but what has happened since, and this talking about the compromise with the 1975 Act, um, denies that reality. <coughs> Do you think that, why are you not making a bigger issue of it? Mm -hmm. Oh, I, I haven't tried to make an issue of anything. I've <laughs> tried to tell it as it is. And, and I, I did point out that I thought the contra pro forentum rule, which is the international convention, is an option to follow. It not, happens not to be the one that we do follow. I have tried not to advocate a position, actually. That's for you guys to do. <laughs> yes. I'll make a point to the Professor. That is not the one principle of interpretation that's used in, in um, interpreting international contracts. And that does relate to very specific contracts, usually commercial ones. To apply it to something like this, you're going to wind up with all kinds of funny results. There are other principles of interpretation. One of which we see is quite bluntly, that if there is no meeting of minds, there is no contract. And if what our friend here is saying is true, and if in fact there is a vast difference between the two editions of the treaty, then we don't have a treaty at all, internationally speaking. And that's sad. I suspect in 1975 they were the, the points that lead to this, this compromise. That's why I'm not a lawyer. <laughs> <laughs> you, don't, you don't get the answers down there. The other, the other thing, though, I, I, I guess we need to be clear on is that the treaty is not a legal document. It's an agreement. Uh, it's, uh, can the treaty be enforced? In New Zealand, it can only be enforced if it's in the law. And it's only in half a dozen laws. I mean, you can, just, you can count them on, at least on, on two hands the number of times the treaty appears in the law. When the treaty's in the law, it can be enforced. When it's not in the law, it can't be enforced in a court. It can't be enforced by a court. But the, legal, the, legal, uh, the treaty is a, is a legal document, or, or having legal implications, is, to my mind, the lesser significance of the treaty. It has, it has had another level altogether and that its legalities shouldn't be confused with its spirit. <laughs> what about the place of later new settlers, that is last 30 years, etc., what secures their entitlements? That's a brief question. Is there, is there, uh, Oh, yeah. um, it was just in, in relation to the legislation that speaks about management and that the provisions are probably what covers when you set this to New Zealand as opposed to the <coughs> as they were written in 1940. So I guess it was just a bit of information that they were on view on where they were set this time. Uh, well, there's two parties to the treaty. There's the tri well, there's Māori, and, and there's some debate about whether the parties to the treaty are Māori people or the tribes. And a lot of Māori groups are sorting, well, working towards sorting that out. <laughs> that's one. The other is the Crown. The Crown represents all New Zealanders, including those people who are recent settlers here. So that uh, if you're using a treaty framework, all people who are New Zealand citizens are party to the treaty. 
either represented by the Crown or represented by the tribes. And I don't really see... I mean, no, there was a headline in the Dominion about a week ago when the, some, some of the results of last year's census came out. And the headline was, number of Asian, uh, Asian population to exceed the Maori population in 50 years. When you read it, it was about there's been a huge increase in the number of Asian people in the country. The mischievousness about the headline was that somehow this is going to be a threat to the Maori population. Now, to my and of course you can always find someone who, who will take that further, and Manu Paul did. Uh, but to my mind, the, uh, no matter what the nature of New Zealand, it doesn't diminish the relationship between Maori on the one hand and Crown on the other. That's the, that's the essence of the treaty, is that relationship. And so uh, New Zealand has always been multicultural. If you, if you look at our... You know, go, to, go, to, go to Dunedin, you think you're in a different country. So it's, there's always been... Uh, we've always been a multicultural country. And the celebration of culture should not be confused with the Treaty of Waitangi. Uh, we, I, I think uh, it's great to be able to celebrate culture, and uh, they're doing that today in Auckland. Uh, they're having this huge Pacific uh, event up there where that's what's being celebrated, is the multicultural nature of New Zealand, and particularly of Auckland. And I think that's great. I don't see a conflict between that and the Treaty of Waitangi, although many people do. Many people would argue that we're a bicultural society, not a multicultural one. Well, there's sort of a, you can only keep that up so long if you keep your eyes closed. <laughs> well, when you open your eyes, you see we are multicultural, and no matter how much you say, well, we shouldn't be, we are. And I don't think it's about having a bicultural society. It's about having a part of, uh, having a understanding in our society that there is this relationship between Maori and the Crown. That is not a contradiction of having a multicultural society, although it's very often put that way, and the Dominion, I think, was mischievous when it did that. No, the Crown, uh, I mean, the, the, uh, the, the, I thought the headline of the Dominion should have read that with the large number of Asian people coming to the country, we will become a republic a little earlier than we might otherwise have become. Well, because I think the, the settlers from Asia and other parts of the Pacific won't necessarily see the link to Britain as having a, a, an important part in New Zealand's future. But they didn't, because they, they seized on the... as if there were a problem with Maori. Then uh, how can the church today, including the Anglican Church, take responsibility today for our futures in relation to the treaty from 1840 and subsequently, who, who, um, have we sort of covered that, do you think? With, well, there might have been another angle you wanted to particularly discuss. Just explain that churches are actually involved with missionaries, and then subsequently, like in Toronto, just in April 1840, Brown Mission was asked by the Australian government to go and seek actively sentences of local chiefs, which he did. Failed subsequently, there was a slight lag in the church's conscience, but it was only a lag and not a permanent lapse. That the, uh, <laughs> the uh, well, what happened, of course, was when, uh, when Hobson said to Colenso, it'll be your job in the future to tell the people what they have signed, that was putting it pretty clearly on the church to, to take this matter seriously. Uh, the church did and then didn't. And there was this lapse in, in quite a long part of New Zealand's history. The Anglican Church and uh, other churches were much less active in... Um, protecting the treaty uh, significance than they might have been. But eventually they did. And they did it in some style, at least the Anglicans did it in some style when the, the, the uh, Bicultural Commission went around and eventually restructured the, uh, the General Synod so that there's a, a Maori house, I'm not sure, a Pacific Island house, and I'm not sure what the other house is called. The third house. <laughs> Is it called Tikanga Pākehā House? I think Fatamuniata refers to it as the Tikanga Pākehā House. I'm not sure exactly what that's called. But what they were saying then is that the church, uh, in its organisational arrangements, recognises groups 
and there, is, there has to be agreement between the groups between, before you can get anything passed through Synod. Now, since then, uh, that same approach has been recommended to the country. Uh, coming out of the Anglican Church position, constitution now, the, um, this is what I say, the church has kind of did it in a big way once they got uh, moving on it, um, have recommended also that, that New Zealand's constitutional arrangements might also change so that you might have, for example, a, uh, a general parliament or general house and a Māori house, and that before anything goes through Parliament, the two houses have to agree, which is basically the, the current Anglican model. And that sitting above that, you might have a Senate, which is composed of 50% Māori, 50% non-Māori, and they would also have to agree before you give uh, approval to acts of Parliament. Well, uh, I mean, it's... Uh, we're just about at that position now. If you look at the Maori caucus, <laughs> rapidly expanding. Uh, if, you, if you can imagine under MMP, if the Maori members of parliament formed a caucus, they would, in this present environment, control the vote. That if, you, if, you, if nothing went through until it got uh, a, a Maori caucus as a whole approving. And that's a bit of a worry to some of the parties because, of course, party politics, party political allegiances tend to be put ahead of Māori allegiances, but there is this quite strong move at present to have within Parliament a Māori caucus, something like what the Anglican Church did, although in a maybe a less formal way. The other question is whether we should have a Senate in New Zealand. We're, we're a bit unique in New Zealand. We don't have an upper house. We're, we're a unicameral government, uh, just one house, and the worry is that the current house, uh, the current Parliament, has no check or balance on it, that it, uh, once it passes, something is through. Uh, most governments in the world do have a house above that, or most democracies in the world uh, have a house above that. We used to. We, we used to have the Legislative Council, uh, which met its demise, I think, in 1950, mainly because it had become sort of a, an afternoon in Bellamy's rather than an act of body. It, it, it ceased to be very useful. But a number of people from time to time talk about re-establishing a Senate in New Zealand. A referendum was taken in 1993. Most New Zealanders said, no, one's enough. We don't want another one. But I heard Jim Bolger advocating for a, a Senate. So was Fina Cooper at the same time, although for quite different reasons. And I think the Senate that each of them were pro proposing would look quite different. But they, uh, they were both proposing that. And the reason for proposing it was that we give our House of Representatives too much authority and we don't provide any balance to it. I think honour is, uh, is the business of the church, too, isn't it? Yeah. And a, um, under the treaty, does it sound like it sounds that Maori should be entitled to a British passport? Well, my son, who's uh, just gone to London, asked me the same question because uh, he's discovered he'll have to leave within two years if he doesn't have a British passport. So he's making a case to have the treaty recognised <laughs> while he's in London and wondered if I could write a paper to help him uh, support that claim. <laughs> because the... Um, <laughs> in 1840, uh, Article 3 did say that, that Māori would have exactly the same entitlements as other British subjects, which included the entitlement entitlement to hold a British passport. 
Since then, of course, uh, Britain has increasingly devolved its responsibilities stepwise, first of all to the New Zealand self-governing colony in 1854, then to the Dominion, and now uh, New Zealand is absolutely independent. But what it does raise is this question that if New Zealand were to become a republic, where would the Treaty of Waitangi stand? I mean, what, uh, the, the official view now is that because New Zealand is so far removed from Britain, a British passport is not recognised in New Zealand and would, would, uh, Britain would deny Māori for it because they say the, the New Zealand citizenship has changed from being a, a British responsibility to a New Zealand responsibility. But will that, will that continue if New Zealand becomes a republic? Which is on the cards. I mean, there uh, has been quite a lot of talk about New Zealand moving towards a republic. Uh, it, when the Queen visited here the last uh, just a couple of weeks ago, the, the issue was raised again, and the Prime Minister thought it was inevitable. I suspect she's right. I, I, uh, I think that. Uh, I mean, it'll probably all hinge on on Camellia Parker Bowles. <laughs> <laughs> If she insists on being the Queen Consort, then you might see a destruction of the monarchy anyway. And Britain might be asking the same question, should we become a prime? Britain is asking the same question. Has the monarchy outlived its usefulness for Great Britain? So I would think that, uh, that New Zealand will move towards becoming a republic. I think Australia will do it before we do, and uh, we will probably follow Australia, I suspect. Then the question comes up. Um, where does the treaty stay in New Zealand's arrangements? Uh, now we talk about the treaty being between the Crown and Māori. If there is no Crown but it's simply a government or a president, will there still be that same uh, obligation on the Crown, on the government? And it's a bit hard to say how that would go. I, I think the, uh, the Māori starting point on that, I, I, I think probably is that not so much that the treaty is a must, but that indigenous rights are a must. And if, I mean, the, the treaty is, is, has been a useful way of negotiating indigenous rights. The treaty is not the same as indigenous rights, but it's been a very useful way of negotiating those rights. If we don't have it, how do we negotiate the rights, or does that put us in the same position as Australia and Canada? In fact, we are virtually a republic already, in the sense that the Queen cannot interfere. Although she's the head of state, our act of parliament stops the Queen or the Governor-General from doing anything other than opening the buildings because they, there, is, there is no way in which they can intervene in New Zealand law. There was, but Geoffrey Palmer tied it up in 1986 so that uh, the, the, the Governor-General or the Queen is obliged to take, on every action, is obliged to take advice from the senior minister and that's, that's the Prime Minister, as a rule. So uh, if we became a republic, the, the Maori starting point would be, I think, that indigenous rights are a must in New Zealand. How do we, how do we recognise that? And if we became a republic, I doubt that we would sort of start afresh and say, let's throw out everything and make a bold new start. I've got a feeling we would just carry on and take the heritage that we've got and move on with it. And I, I doubt that there would be any major overhaul. And I suspect that although most New Zealanders may not agree with the relevance of the treaty, that I think the government would continue to recognise it, if only because it's the lesser of two evils, <laughs> that if you don't have it, you've got no way of negotiating indigenous rights. And that is an international, that's going to be an international issue that New Zealand, like other countries, will have to face. So I, I suspect that, uh, that the British passport will, will no longer, I, I don't think my son will win his case, actually. And I, I think we'll see him home within the two years. <laughs> In fact, we're, we're quite keen not to help his case. <laughs> so he will come home. So I don't think that'll happen. Uh, and I think the argument there is that, that uh, the citizenship rights that are talked about in Article 3 have really moved, not have moved from Britain to the New Zealand state. And if we become a republic, I suspect 
that we would continue to recognize the treaty within our constitution. And I guess we'd have a written constitution if we become a republic, which will be a field day for you lawyers. <laughs> it may not be much fun for anyone else, but I, we don't have a written constitution. New Zealand's got a funny, funny constitutional arrangement. Our head of state lives 12,000 miles away, comes here every five years. We don't have a written constitution, and most countries do, although I understand Trinidad doesn't, nor does Barbados. <laughs> that uh, we, still ha we still have recourse to the, court of appeal, uh, to the Privy Council as our ultimate course of appeal. Most countries don't. Most countries have developed their own second level of the Court of Appeal. And we don't have a written constitution, and most countries have. So uh, constitutionally, we, we, the people are beginning to feel that we ought to tidy things up a little bit. And I mean, uh, uh, Jim Bolger, I heard him give a talk after he'd been in, uh, in America as the ambassador there for a while. And he said, we're not exactly the laughing stock of America, but people think that New Zealand's constitutional arrangements are rather quaint. <laughs> and they just have a bit of trouble understanding uh, how come that uh, if, the, if the Queen is the head of state, that means we're part of England. No, you're not. We just share the same monarch and that they can't understand it and think, uh, well, what, what does your constitution say? Well, we actually we don't have a written constitution. And it's all a bit too much for the Americans to understand. They were the... Uh, 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 sorry, I forgot who, who uh, asked that last question. Did, did you want to comment further on it? same rights <coughs> as the British, um, yeah, the Queen's British um, subjects, and that's why I just asked, did it sound like it sounded? Yeah, well it was, it was that way in, in 1840, but I'll give you my son's email and you just might like to get in touch with him, <laughs> support his case. <laughs> well, I think just before we uh, broke for lunch, we, uh, there was also an indication that uh, people might want to make comments or, or make an observation that wasn't so much a question. And uh, do we want to break for five minutes and maybe come back and uh, have a look at that? Okay. How many uh, Treaty of Waitangi seminars I've been to, but I've been to a lot. I've heard many, many people talk about the treaty. But every time I hear Mason, I get a new revelation every time I hear him. And uh, it's just, it's been such a blessing having him here uh, with us. One of the things that I know is that Mason uh, researches thoroughly. Okay. Are you able to hear me? Uh, is everybody able to hear me? Okay. Um, the research, you can get, I can guarantee you the research is impeccable and thorough and is seen from many, many angles. And what I've loved about the presentation today, I believe it was a really godly presentation, and that it was very positive. And it was, there was no blame placed on anybody. I don't know whether you gathered that. There's no guilt placed on any group of people. And that's how Really, I was, I was sitting there, I was thinking, if the Lord Jesus Christ was sitting here in the church today, in physical, physically I mean, in the physical, what would he be saying? How would he react? And I think he would have said, great job. Great job, Mason. You know. Uh, it was so positive. And it was, it, it's about going forward, not about, not about going backwards and uh, about being clear and not being hazy and uh, about it. And I think that, you know, all of us probably have come in here with different ideas about the treaty, but uh, I enjoyed the presentation very much. Just two things I want to, I want to uh, comment on. One is Maori people in the church the place of Māori people in the church of Jesus Christ, the place of, uh, of Māori decision-making processes, the place of Māori expressions of worship 
in the forms of waiata, haka, and those, that's, that's one area that I want to comment about today. The second uh, comment I want to make is about autonomy, the whole area of autonomy, about the Māori people searching for autonomy and what that means. And what I'm going to, uh, in that, when I talk about that, I'm going to talk about how I have been involved in those particular movements and what have been the results and, and what does it look like now. Do we have any regrets about our push in those days towards autonomy? First, so my first expression is about the response of the Church of Jesus Christ to the evangelical charismatic movement as well as the mainstream churches to Maori expressions. Now, for example, there is a, there is a notion now, sorry, Tor, there is a notion now that Io, Io, Io is God, the name I-O. Eo is God. All right. Yes. Yeah. He will too. He's coming back. He's coming back on. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. I, I'm just the uh, intermission. Talk. <laughs> I'm just like the entertainer in between, you know. Yeah, yeah, the joker. Yeah. Um, and. The, the whole notion of, of Eo as the, uh, is he God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the God of the Bible. And there is that, that within the church at the moment, and many people are talking in that particular way. I just want to make one comment about that. When we were in um, Korea, and Linda and I and a team of us were in Korea last year, and uh, we asked them all, the name for God is Hananim, isn't it? I said, yes, Hananim is the name of our God, yes. Was, was Hananim the name of your God before the Christians came to Korea? And they said, yes. And uh, so that was interesting. When we were in Egypt, before we were in Korea, we were actually in Egypt. And we were amongst beautiful Christian groups doing wonderful work uh, in the... Uh, dumps and places like that. And, uh, and every time, and, and our Egyptian brothers and sisters taught us a song, an Egyptian song, and, it's, and they call God Allah. Allah is God in the Christian movement. But Allah is also God to the Muslims. Same name. So the question is, is the God of Islam, the Muslim church, the same as the Allah of the Christian church? And it was a really interesting question, really interesting question. The Egyptians, a couple of the Egyptian pastors answered it this way. The Allah that we pray to, we get to him through Jesus Christ. He is the Allah we pray to. The Allah, our brothers, our, our Islam brothers uh, pray to, they do not get to him through Jesus Christ. So that was the answer. So the other expressions, you know, within, within the Church of, of New Zealand now, you're starting to get people doing haka, you're getting to them to do waiata and all of those sorts of things. And the question is, is the church opening their way to to allowing haka to be used, for example, to tell the, the story of the uh, crucifixion and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And we know of a group who do a haka this, to this, to the Word of God. Uh, we do, I do a haka to Ephesians chapter 6, verses 10 to 18. Linda and I and our teams do to put on the whole armor of God. <clears throat> So what we're doing is we're finding our expression to Jesus through our culture, through our culture, you know. And it's these sorts of things. Now, the other, the other question that needs to be asked, though, in relation to this is, where are the Maori people in the decision-making within the churches, 
within the evangel evangelical churches. Where are they? Are they in your leadership? Are they part of your leadership? Or where are they? Are they part of your eldership? Things like that. Are they, are they, are they given, being given like an expression, say, a, uh, are they uh, being given positions of leadership? And when they're in their leadership, are they able to be Maori in the expression of their leadership? And these are kind of sort of questions. The next one I want to talk about is the whole area of autonomy. Uh, I was involved in the establishment of Wananga. You know, Wananga are Maori tertiary institutions. And currently there are three of them. There's Te Wananga Raukawa. Uh, uh, although Te Wananga Raukawa was well established by the time we, we started uh, writing legislation for that particular area. There's Te Wananga Raukawa, Te Whare Wananga Awa Nui Harangi, and Te Wananga Aotearoa. Hands up those who have heard about those Wananga in this, in this audience. Oh, it's good. It's quite a few. Okay. Now, they are, they are tertiary institutions. Uh, they exist alongside universities, teachers' colleges, and polytechnics. They, however, are proactive in allowing Māori courses uh, to be held. And um, one of them, Te Wananga Aotearoa, has actually now become the fourth largest tertiary institution in New Zealand with 25,000 students. So, you know, they, they are making a, an impact, if you like, in New Zealand. That is an area of, of autonomy that, is, that has found expression in New Zealand and which I believe is really promoting uh, what is good in our country. Uh, in that Wananga, you will find that 20% 20, 20 of the teachers are, are, are Pākehā, 80% close to 80% are Māori. Uh, the students would be around about 80% Māori, 20% other, other peoples. So there is a very, very exciting development there. And in the education system and also in the health system, that's where you are seeing this autonomous movement. I believe that it is a good for New Zealand. I really do. I was at the um, inauguration of the bishop, of the last bishop in the Anglican Church in Auckland about three weeks ago. And uh, the three tikanga bishops were there. There's the uh, Māori bishop, Bishop Virko, the tikanga Pākehā bishop, I don't know what his name is, and the tikanga Pacific Island uh, bishop. Okay. And they were there and they were, they were sitting there and I tell you what, it's one of the most beautiful occasions I've ever been to. So it doesn't jeopardize our country's well-being or our country's welfare. I believe it enhances it. So that's all I want to say. That's all I want to say. I want to say that uh, that, that is, if you like, the, the material part of what, of what Mason was talking about today. Um, Mason, can I ask you to come back now? We've only got a few minutes, please. And then we'll end with some prayer and... Uh well, I, I um, didn't necessarily want to say anything myself, but to give an opportunity for others who would, would like to make a comment or, uh, about the treaty or, or a view on it, maybe to come up here and do that and I, so I can sit down. But come up, come up here. There's the, the microphone here, and uh, we'll carry a bit better. Is it on? Yes, I think I'm going to switch it on now. It should be on. Kia ora, Mr. Jury. Is that you there? Is it on here? Tēnā kei Mr. Jury. The, if I can just get back to the, you mentioned the word controversial, 
preferentum, which no longer applies in this country. And I understand that it's been ruled out by the powers and authority of this country for obvious reasons. It's not on the, the gloss, glossary of technical points, legal terms, and it's obvious, for obvious reasons it's to the advantage of non-Maori to take it out. Do you, do you accept that point? And, and it doesn't, and it doesn't advantage Maori. You accept that? Uh, I think there are a lot of uh, a lot of claimants to the Waitangi Tribunal who would share your view entirely. Okay. Maori have given the crown the right to govern. and only the right to govern. But, it, but that Maori have retained the right to rule. If they're given away the right to govern, they still retain the right to rule. They haven't given that, way, that right away yet because we still have rangatiratanga, our, our equivalent to sovereignty. Do you accept that, Mr. Mason, uh, Mr. Dewey? Might be better if you leave it on. The, the, the uh, right to rule over our own affairs. Hmm. Okay. Did Did you know? Have you studied the? 1852 Constitution Act, Mr. Dewey? I am familiar with it. Familiar. Did you know that the Act, that Act gave us Māori the right to rule, the right to govern our own country, our, our own people? Uh, so I think section 17, 17. Set aside areas where Māori uh, law could prevail. Thank you. Did you also know that the, the 1852 Constitution gave the powers to the white settlers to rule, to govern in this country? Mm, that was the act that established the New Zealand Parliament. Correct. But did you, you understand that the, that Constitution, 52 Constitution was repealed? 1986. You see, once it's repealed, once that act, the 52 Act, where it gave non maori the, the white settlers, the right to govern, and gets repealed, you no longer have the right to, to govern when you repeal your own act. Oh, but it was replaced by another act. Yeah, but once you repeal it, you 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 no longer have the right to make more laws in this when you once it's repealed. The 1852 Act, of course, was passed by a British Parliament. The 1986 Act was the replacement for that passed in New Zealand. So there's that period when uh, we were our constitution was determined by, ironically, by a British law. It wasn't until 1986 that the British law was replaced by a New Zealand law. There are many, there are many chiefs and tribes that, have, that did not sign the treaty. They, many chiefs and tribes did not sign the treaty in, this, in Aotearoa. It is not, not accepted, therefore, that if, if that Māori who did not sign, are not bound by imperial laws. Do you accept that, Mr. Jury? There was a, uh, a meeting in 1860 uh, called by the governor at the time. I think his name was Governor, Fitz, governor Gore Brown. 
1860, called the Kohimarama Conference, in which all the tribes, including those who hadn't signed the treaty, attended and agreed that the treaty was applicable to everyone. Mm. I'll go on to the next one because that one's, that answer's not acceptable to me, but however, I'll go on to the next one. And the last one. The Treaty of Waitangi, um, pertaining to the the uh, contra pro forentum bit that's been taken out of out of the glossaries of uh, technical glossaries of this country. The Treaty of Waitangi is a sovereign sovereign document. It's a treaty to treat. It's a document to of agreement. It's a document of covenant, and it's under sovereign lo uh, under laws of sovereignty. Sovereign treaties are conducted under laws of sovereignty. So how does a country of, a little country of New Zealand come along and take it out, the word contra proferendum? Yeah, I, I've last asked the last question. We have five or six questions. Well, these people have only been able to answer to us only one. Yeah. So I think that that's an unfair advantage. Yeah. And uh, if you want to speak to Mason at another time... Yeah. I've asked the last question, it's finished. Okay. Well, I'm getting here that this is unfair and that... Uh, Thank you for your questions. Uh, it's always good to... Uh, I mean, there are many views on the treaty, and there are many views about the New Zealand position, and it's good, I think, in the long run to have all those views uh, discussed openly. So I, I, I thank you for that. The, the question of uh, how come New Zealand is such a little country should depart from the contra pro forendum rule is a, is a very good question, because uh, here we are, a small blob, on the globe, miles away from anywhere, doing it our own way. And uh, I don't know why we do it our own way, but that seems to be a New Zealand style. And it does put us a little bit outside some of the conventions followed in other countries. And I guess uh, there's more debate to be had on that. So th th that's your answer? Yes. Thank you. All right. <laughs> Uh, thanks for the question. Have we got another question that you want to? Okay. Come, come, come over here. Kia ora, uh, kia ora Mason. I just um, wanted to know, sometimes the treaty is seen as a mechanism or an instru instrument of governance, and when people are looking at the implementation of that, it, the ideas that come out are, do, are to do with more along the lines of promoting language, promoting haka, the types of things that Monty spoke to earlier. Is that inconsistent? with the objectives of the treaty? Well, I don't think so. I think that um, while governance is part of the treaty, there is a broader issue, and the issue is about the terms under which Māori can live in New Zealand, and the treaty was making certain guarantees. And one of the guarantees the treaty makes is that Māori people can continue to be Māori, which means their language is protected, their customs are protected, their ways of doing things are protected. And that's, that's what the treaty is about, fundamentally, that uh, being a New Zealand citizen doesn't mean you have to stop being Māori. The guarantee is the other way, that you can continue to live as Māori. Thank you. 
Um, I just wanted to um, ask a question. You made a statement earlier on about how um, <coughs> you thought uh, New Zealand had actually been quite, um, had a good track record, I think you, is how you put it, of Indigenous rights. Compared to Australia. Yeah, and I think, yeah. <laughs> And for me, that yeah, it's it's interesting that we get that response, that we get a lot of laughter at that, because I think that um, if all you do is compare indigenous rights with other nations, you actually fall short, because all you're doing is you're minimising the pain of a certain nation. And sure, you might be able to say, well, it's a lot worse in Australia than it is here. But if you're Māori, perhaps growing up in this country and have ancestors or um, that have had a a lot of pain by saying that, well, at least we're better off than um, Australia, that can minimise that pain, and I, that's, that's a problem for me, personally. I don't like to compare it. And I was interested that you said we've got a good track record and you used um, how we have full Māori seats in Parliament as a, an illustration of that. And my understanding in that legislation, 1867 Māori Represent Representation Act, was actually um, a means to limit the Māori vote and to limit the Māori voice so that Māori couldn't have a lot of say and that power would not be given to them in Parliament. And you're interested that you didn't actually mention the legislation. I understand that we didn't have a lot of time today, but the many, many, many legislations which have brought a lot of injustice to Māori was not mentioned. And um, that's a really big issue. And if we say that we've got a good track record and that we need to move forward in development and forget about the grievances, then in a sense we're missing the point because my, in my perspective um, you need to look at those injustices and grievances and not dwell on them but use them as a base for actually moving forward in development and if we don't look at them how can we actually move forward because we don't know what it's about and you need to address those things and as a, as a Christian and as part of the church we need to actually take some responsibility and not feel guilty. I'm not saying it's our fault, but let's look at it and work out what the injustices are and how can we actually be a part of solving the problem and how can we honour the treaty as, for myself as Pākehā and as Christian. Um, it, it was our people who, who um, brought the laws into Parliament. It was the missionaries who misinterpreted the treaty for whatever reasons they had that... Um, puts, puts us here in a position where we actually need to take a bit of responsibility. So partly it's, it's a question and partly it's a comment that, um, <laughs> and a chance to have a say. <laughs> That's good. But, um, yeah, so... I'm just trying to work out the, which was the question, which was the comment, but um, I, I think, could I, I just, just stress part of it? Sure. You're quite right with the 1867 uh, My Representation Act. There, there was two motivations for it. One was that uh, the many Māori people were outnumbering others and other That's electorates, right. and yeah. this was way of limited. The other thing it had to do with, it was nothing to do with the Treaty of Waitangi, by the way. Mm. The other thing it had to do with was equalising the North-South vote. There had been a lot of miners come into the South Island. The South Islanders wanted more seats in Parliament. North Islanders didn't want to give them. They added four Māori seats, three in the North Island and one in the South Island, and the North Island managed to keep its, its um, position mm. as against the South. So you're quite right that the, the, uh, the motivation for the act was fairly suspect and you wouldn't want to write a book about it. But the, the effect of it was very significant. And when I talked about uh, the proud record New Zealand has, I, I think I qualified it by saying it wasn't a perfect record. Yeah. But I, when, yeah, you, when you look at, uh, in, if you look at the indigenous movement, mm. and uh, I was at a conference in Canada a couple of years ago, and what hit me was the number of indigenous groups who got up and said, if only we had representation in Parliament. And when I said we've had it since 1867, there was a feeling around the indigenous communities that that had been a hugely uh, important event, even though the motivation for it was pretty suspect, mm. very suspect. The, the question you raise about uh, the grievances of the past, there are 780 claims before the Waitangi Tribunal. That tells you how much grievance there is. And I don't, under, I don't uh, uh, minimise that in any way. I think they're hugely important uh, claims, each one of them, and I hope we settle them pretty soon. The, the point I was making is that fundamentally the grievances and the claims of the tribunal are a reflection of the way the treaty was not honoured. It's not essentially about the message of the treaty. It's about not honouring the treaty, that message. And I think that the next 
two decades, three decades ahead of us, the treaty argument will shift from one of grievance to one of development. Mm. That's the point I was mm. trying to make. Sure. Yeah. And can I just make a final comment in response to that? Um, I think that yeah, what you've said is true, and I know you qualified it by saying that um, although... Um, what was the point? <laughs> no, although... Um, it wasn't perfect, I said. Yeah, although it wasn't perfect. Um, I, I don't want that to be... From Queen Elizabeth, by the way. <laughs> I, don't want to, I don't want that to be an excuse for us as the church right. to say we've done a good job, you know. We're do doing really well in this country and we've done really well in the church, both statements with Ma which Mason has made. And yes, there, have, there are steps that have been made, but we've got a long way to go. And let's not just sit here going, well, it's actually going along okay, and, um, and leave it at that. So, kia ora. Thank you. Yeah, very good. Yes, I, I think just adding on to that question, the hard part is yet to come. The easy part is dealing with Treaty of Waitangi claims. Now, you may not think it's pretty easy, but it is easier than how the treaty is relevant to New Zealand's future development. And I think that's going to be the taxing part for us as a nation. Yes. Kia ora, Professor Mason. Um, my question is a real easy one, I hope. <laughs> um, I was listening to you talking about autonomy is limited when we have neighbours. When you talk about neighbours, I suppose I'm one of those neighbours, being a Cook Islander. I've been in a bicultural class in the late 80s where there was Pākehā and there was Māori, and I, me being a Pacific Islander, you're stuck in the middle. Um, how best to communicate the Treaty of Waitangi amongst our Pacific Island people who are immigrating here 11 times faster than, well, they're going at a rate that is really huge. They're more immigrating here than they are leaving here. How best to um, communicate the Treaty of Waitangi to our Pacific Island communities who come and settle here? Well, one, one way is to read, the, read them the preamble to the treaty. And if you read them the preamble, put the commas in in the right place so that it sounds sensible, <laughs> you'll find that the treaty there talks about the immigration which is yet to occur. Mm. Uh, so the treaty was for settlers who were coming to this country, as well as for Māori who were already here. Right. Okay. And you'd see that as being, like you say, because we're, New Zealand is so small, um, and that autonomy doesn't work here. I suppose what I'm looking absolute at... Absolute autonomy doesn't work. Absolute. It, I don't think it works in any country. Right. Yeah, including Afghanistan. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Yes, I think there is sometimes a feeling from other Pacific nations that somehow the treaty excludes them. I think anyone who is a, a New Zealand citizen is a part, is encompassed, embraced by the treaty, because the treaty was anticipated people who would be coming to New Zealand. That's what the preamble says. Kia ora. Um, here's just a couple of questions. A um, couple of questions he's got. Yeah. Um, let me see now. Yeah, you may, may mention earlier that the treaty is an agreement but not a legal contract. I'm just having a little difficulty understanding how an agreement between two parties with signatures under the witness of God is considered to be different than a legal contract when it's considered, when um, other international treaties are considered by international courts of law as contracts. The law of contra preferendum is actually a legal termination which is applied to those treaties, so why is it not applied to the so called agreement, the Treaty of Waitangi? Just, just two points on it. I, I think an agreement before God uh, is an agreement of which God, God is the ultimate judge. The Court of Appeal is not a very good replacement for God. <laughs> but the, I'd agree with that. The, the, uh, the other point is that, and uh, the irony is, international agreements are not part of the, the domestic law in a country. So that because you have an international agreement, it's not reflected in your internal legal arrangements. So that the, the treaty is legal when it's in the law. When it's not in the law, it's higher than the law 
in the sense that it's part of the fabric of the nation, but not in the law. It's, so it's one of the ironies that the international laws are not part of domestic law. Okay. So um, why is it that the government assertion to sovereignty, which was as a result of the Treaty of Waitangi, was um, proclaimed basically before the treaty was even finished being signed, when it hadn't actually been through the legal processes of being recognised. Yeah, that's, that's a... Uh, that you wouldn't want, again, that's something else you wouldn't want to write a book about, because it was, done, it was done hastily, and Hobson actually rushed it. And if you wanted to question that and ask for a judicial review of the process, <laughs> you would be in pretty strong grounds, because he, he acted prematurely, and he acted before he knew that there was agreement with the treaty. Yes, there's obviously a few deficiencies there. One last point. Um, under, both, under the English version of the treaty, we were guaranteed our property rights, which, you've, um, which you mentioned yourself, was a universal right that was um, available to all people with their property and possession. So we weren't really being guaranteed anything that nobody else already had. The other thing that we were purportedly um, offered by way of the treaty was protection, which we'd already been offered in 1835 by Busby, and which we no longer seem to have anymore from the British government, mm. even though it was supposedly meant to, the contract was meant to be forever. Um, so just looking at that, we gave, supposedly, gave the, government, um, the, the Crown a huge, hmm, something huge, which is the sovereignty over our country that we had already established five years prior. What, the question is, what did we get in return for that? We'd already been promised protection. We were given property rights, which were universal rights. So what did we get in return for that? British passport. <laughs> well, we haven't even got that anymore. <laughs> no, you, 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 you're quite right. Was the deal a good deal? Uh, uh, to give away sovereignty is quite a lot to give away. Uh, that's that's, that's a, a huge thing to give. What, was it a good deal? Did you get much back in return? The, the question about uh, protection, uh, guaranteeing property rights, you're quite right. That was part of British common law anyway. But it's, it was, you've got to put it in 1840 language when it wasn't so usual for sh huge colonising powers like Great Britain to recognise indigenous rights. So Britain was sort of reminding itself in Article 2 that you need to be fair to indigenous people as you are to your own people. This was new thinking for Britain. Uh, in theory, with the, there's the only new thing that Maori got out of it, apart from the fact that Britain would protect them internationally, was, this, was Article 3 of citizenship rights. That was new. Oh, yeah. thanks. thanks a lot for all those rights. We're just uh, going to have one more, one more question, and then uh, we'll have a prayer, and then we'll hymn or something to sing. Uh, kia ora Mason, thank you very much for the way you've laid things out this day. And um, my question really isn't so much to you as to the conveners. I actually really want to thank Monty and Alan and your community here. I think it was really inspirational to offer this topic for this day. And um, yes, people might want to acknowledge that. <laughs> Uh, my concern is our moving on as Christian people from here. Um, I mean, just for me, one of the th words that came to me is that part of our strength is the area of the healing of relationships. And as a Pākehā person, I think maybe one of the important things to learn, I've done a lot of treaty education myself, it's very easy to say forgive and forget when you're not the offended partner. And so I think it's in that dialogue and that really listening to one another that, you know, that room for the healing of relationships and, and, and the justice of things as ways forward. I've really taken that strongly out of today. So um, just as 
a suggestion as moving on, I know that I would think it would be a wonderful thing if either your group or another group who is here would be prepared to convene a follow-up day where we are facilitated as church communities to say, you know, how, how do we take this on board and how do we advance it and share ideas with one another about what our communities are doing and what we might do. So it's mine's more a request as well as a deep thanks to you. Mm. say a couple of words in conclusion and uh, first of all when, when, when Monty said he, he wondered uh, what Jesus Christ would have said if he were sitting here I must say when I heard the questions I thought that he actually might be <laughs> but um, to uh, just to reiterate uh, what the uh, the last speaker said uh, to thank uh, Alan and Monty who have uh, been prime movers in this and to thank, uh, thank you for inviting me uh, here, uh, hopefully not to confuse you too much. Uh, the, the, uh, the, there are no absolute answers to the issues we've been talking about. Uh, we'd, we'd be fooling ourselves if we thought that we knew it all or that we knew exactly how things will plan out or that what's right and what's wrong. Uh, we can try and understand a situation. And uh, the, the important issue is that we should be mature enough to discuss the situation. And I think New Zealand probably is about at that level. The discussion isn't always enlighten enlightening, but uh, more and more it is enlightening. And, and I think uh, that as we think where we're heading, uh, the way forward, where we've come from as a, as a nation, as uh, peoples in a nation, that will bring with us uh, what we've experienced, all the journeys that we've travelled on one way or another will be part of us and part of our heritage and we won't want to leave that behind. Even the painful bits, I suspect, will carry on and be part of us. But we also have to be ready for quite different times ahead of us. And uh, I come back to the main point I made that fundamentally the, the treaty's message is about how we work together for the future. And that's a huge challenge to New Zealand because we have not tended to think about the treaty in that light. And uh, the, the, the final point uh, that I'd just like to reiterate is, is this question about the treaty being much bigger than notions of governance or notions of legality or notions of right and wrong. The treaty has a dimension which is much uh, more embracing than that. And within that, it's very much part of the New Zealand past and the New Zealand future. Kia ora. We will uh, sing and then Alan will close with the prayer. Uh, tēnā kua, um, Mason, mō tō, uh, uh, Korero mō te uh, triti o Waitangi te nā koe e hoa. Um, ko tēnei waiata, this song is um, that we will sing together is I love you Lord and I lift my voice. And I think it's just appropriate because it says here, um, take joy my king in what you hear. And I think for us today it's, what, it's the spirit on which we come and present these issues, isn't it? It's the spirit and it's what, what God hears. And it says on the next bit, let it be a sweet, sweet sound unto your ear. And that's the key for us as men and women who desire to speak, to talk, to present issues pertaining to the Tiriti or Waitangi is let us bring it as men and women of God and a spirit in which we can go forward and not forgetting those things behind us and to put them right. So kia kaha and let's stand, we are standing and let's sing this beautiful song. I love you Lord and I live
Father, thank you for a marvellous day that we've had together. Thank you for the insight, the wisdom and the grace that we've seen exemplified as um, Professor Dury has shared with us and talked with us about these important matters. Thank you for the light and the understanding that has been brought to bear. Thank you, Lord, for the positive note that has been shared. We started at the beginning of the day to ask that you would impact our lives, that you would bring fresh revelation, and Lord, you've done that, and we want to thank you. Uh, thank you for this gathering. Thank you for every person that has been here. Thank you, Lord, for uh, Mason and for his contribution today. And uh, Lord, as we go on our way now, as we ponder about our future together, as we take up the suggestion that was shared at the end here as to what we should do next. And uh, I pray that you'll grant us wisdom and um, that we may know the right steps to take. Yes, Lord, there is going to be new developments and new issues, and I pray that we all would know with greater wisdom and clarity how we are to respond. But today we thank you for uh, this information and this knowledge, which enables us to be more informed participants in the ongoing discussion uh, in our various places of work and living around New Zealand. And so for this we give you thanks. And most of all, Lord, we want to give you the honour and the praise for being present today. We now ask that you would bless us on our way. And uh, again, thank you for this great time together. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, good afternoon, folks. And uh, it's been great to uh, be able to have hosted this. It's been a joy to work with Monty. And uh, I have uh, been hugely helped myself. And uh, uh, just uh, watch the space for edition number two. God bless you.